Um, so if you could just bow your heads with me to pray. Okay. Dear Jesus, um, thank you so much for this blessed Sabbath day. And thank you that we can all be here to worship you. And thank you for sending your son um, to come to the world and save us. And please be with us as we study your word. Um, please help the words from my mouth not to be from myself, but from you. And please help us um, to get a blessing from the message and to learn something. Um, and please help it to refine our characters. In your name we pray, amen. Okay. So, how many of you have ever felt sorry for yourselves? Sometimes you ever feel like your burdens are too much for you to bear? Well, have things ever reached the point where you thought it would be easier if you'd just die? Well, I hope not, but if so, you're in good company with many great men in the Bible. So, how many of you know the story of Jonah? Probably all of you there. Um, Jonah was a prophet asked to preach a message um, of warning to the Ninevites, but he didn't want to go. But with the help of a big fish, um, he was on the right path again. And after three days in the belly of the fish, he repented and decided to do what God wanted him to do. But after delivering the message, Jonah goes out of the city um, just to watch to see what will happen. And what happens? Nothing. Because uh, Nineveh repented and um, God spared them. But um, if you can turn with me to Jonah um, chapter 3, verses 10. And say amen when you're there. Amen. Okay. So Jonah chapter 3, verses 10. And it said, Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. But we see in chapter 4, verses 1, that he's not very happy about this. It says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. And then skip down to verses 3. It said, Therefore, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Now, why was Jonah angry? Was it simply because he wanted to see a city with more than 120,000 people in it destroyed? Well, in Prophets and Kings, it says, when Jonah learned of God's purpose to spare the city, that notwithstanding its wickedness had been led to depend in sackcloth and ashes, he should have been the first to rejoice because of God's amazing grace. But instead, he allowed his mind to dwell upon the possibility of his being regarded as a false prophet. Jealous of his reputation, he lost sight of the infinitely greater value of the should in that wretched city. Mm. The compassion shown by God toward the repentant Ninevites displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Was, was not this my saying, he inquired of the Lord, when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentant thee of the evil. Again, Jonah set his mind to doubt God's authority and power. He became so focused on himself that he became numb to having any sympathy for the city with so many precious lives of the truly repentant people. Now some of you might be thinking, Lydia, Jonah's not a, the best example of a great man in the Bible. But, okay, I can understand that. But have you considered Job? Turn with me to Job chapter 1, verses 1. Say amen when you're there. Okay. So, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. Sounds like a pretty great fellow, right? Okay. Well, let's fast forward to the part where he has been through some great suffering. Job 3.11 says, Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Job was going through some serious pain of losing his children, his possessions, and his health. So, was it right for Job to be distraught? 
Or what about Moses? When he first left Egypt, he went to work as a shepherd for several years. And in Ministry of Healing, it says, he learned faith and meekness, patience, humility, and self-forgetfulness. He learned to care for the weak, to nurse the sick, to seek after the straying, to bear with the unruly, to tend the lambs, and to nurture the old and feeble. But after several years in the desert the Israelite, with the Israelite nation, Moses lost his cool a few times. It got to the point when, after the Israelites had complained about only having heavenly manna to eat, that he got so frustrated that he cried out, Where am I to get meat for these people? For they weep all over me, saying, Give us meat that we may eat. I'm not able to bear all these people alone, because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please, kill me here and now, if I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my wretchedness. So, sure, it must have been extremely frustrating to constantly have so many people whining that you're making their life miserable, but was it right for Moses to be discouraged? And what about Elijah? He was a strong prophet of the Lord and had been completely relying on God for years to protect and provide for him. But right after God had just sent him to take down 450 of Baal's prophets, he seemed to have forgotten about all the years that God took care of him in the wilderness. He fell into a moment of great despair, so great that he wished death. 1 Kings 19.4 says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough now. Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Now, was it right for Elijah to lack a trust in God? All of these men in the Bible were at a low point, and they handled their situations differently. While they all experienced self-pity, they decided to come out of it and realize that God is bigger than their troubles. And if they just relied on him, their troubles would be fixed. Initially, they began with self-pity. They all thought, oh, poor me, life can't possibly get any worse than this. But rather than really looking at their situation and trying to look for solutions instead of focusing on the problem, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> rather than looking at their situations and trying to um, find solutions to their problems. Okay. Um, but we can't afford to let our spirits um, chafe over any real or supposed wrong done to ourselves. Self is the enemy we most need to fear. No form of vice has more baleful effect upon the character than has human passion, not under the control of the Holy Spirit. No other victory we can gain will be so precious as the victory gained over self. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have emotions, but it's not okay to let them take you into a state of self-pity. That's when you begin to make your problems bigger than God. Now, it can be tempting to give into your emotions and only consider the wrong done to you, but you need to focus on the things that you can control and leave the rest to God. So, we need to be aware of self-pity. Never indulge the feeling that you are not esteemed as you should be, that your efforts are not appreciated, that your work is too difficult. Let the memory of what Christ has endured for us silence every murmuring thought. We are treated better than was our Lord. Now, how often do you dwell on a problem and complain rather than trying to actually fix it? I know, I'm extremely guilty of this. And I complain and dwell on the things that are wrong rather than actually trying to fix, like, fix the problem. But complaining can be a deadly addiction and it's hard to break. But once we focus on what's right in our life and deal with the bad, um, we can find a lot of peace when we learn to rely on God and fully appreciate his goodness. While Job, Moses, and Elisha woke up from their state of self-pity, Jonah, on the other hand, decided to ruminate on his troubles using self-justification in an attempt to rationalize his feelings that Nineveh should be destroyed. Instead of rejoicing that thousands of lives were saved, he was so worried that he'd be embarrassed or thought of as a liar that he wished that the city would be destroyed. He sat under his plant thinking to himself, perhaps the people in the city really did deserve to die. After all, they were sinners. Okay, this is an extreme case, but many people do use self-justification in this way. 
In psychology, there's a term called cognitive dissonance, which is mental stress or discomfort experienced by an individual who holds two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values at the same time, or is confronted by new information that conflicts with existing beliefs, ideas, or values. As humans, we like to reduce any discomfort that we may be feeling. Um, so we do one of two things. We either stop doing what's causing us mental distress, or we can change our beliefs so what we're doing no longer causes us mental stress. For example, for some people, when they accidentally hurt someone, they'll try to come up with several reasons why that person might have actually deserved what happened. This is to justify what they've individually done. So, for example, me and Talika are roommates. Let's say Talika and I have the same bag of cookies, which we do. But anyways, and I accidentally eat some of her cookies one day. Instead of feeling bad, I might start thinking to myself about a time she did something annoying or she used something of mine. Then I feel justified in what I've done, which creates the cognitive dissonance and makes me feel comfortable about what I've done. So, and here are some types of self-justification that people use. There's legalism, which is trying to save ourselves by obedience and works of the law. Rationalism, making excuses for sin through argument and false reasoning. Hedonism, pursuing pleasure to avoid pain and drown the conscience. Materialism, acquiring riches as a means of feeling wor worthy and building pride. Narcissism, exhibiting vanity and pride, exaltation over others as a means of feeling worthy. Emotionalism, seeking the ultimate relationship or emotional state. Achievism, setting and fulfilling goals as a means of achieving, achieving worthiness. Egotism, replacing the desire for God's approval with the approval for others, of others. Perfectionism, doing things precisely and perfectly to alleviate a sense of dissonance. Nihilism, obsessing with death and self-destruction. Atonement through self-punishment. Now friends, you need to be careful to not let the bad things in your life get you down. Don't focus on self or try to justify what you've done or rationalize to excuse your behavior. The spirit of self-justification originated in the father of lies and has ex been exhibited by all the sons and daughters of Adam. God has said, you are beautifully and wonderfully made, so what right do you have to feel sad or feel that your life is worthless? Do you not believe that God is enough to make you whole and to help you pass your mistakes? Be careful not to get caught up in thinking that you're not good enough and can't be used for God's service. God can use anyone with a cheerful spirit and a love of Christ. You can't go around all gloomy or sad because you'll nullify any witnessing that you can do to others. Steps to Christ says, If we do represent Christ, we shall make his service appear attractive, as it really is. Christians who gather up gloom and sadness to their souls and murmur and complain are giving to others a false representation of God and the Christian life. They give the impression that God is not pleased to have his children happy, and in this they bear false witness against our Heavenly Father. Another thing we need to do is to be sure that we're not being discouraged. Yeah, sometimes things happen in life that are upsetting, but we shouldn't let it keep us from continuing God's work. God's messengers in the great cities are not to become discouraged over the wickedness, the injustice, the depravity, which they are called upon to face while endeavoring to proclaim the glad tidings of salvation. The Lord would cheer every such worker with the same message that he gave to the Apostle Paul in wicked Corinth. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. Let those engaged in soul-saving ministry remember that while there are many who will not heed the counsel of God in his word, the whole world will not turn from the light and truth, from the invitations of a patient, forbearing Savior. In every city, filled though it may be with violence and crime, there are many who, with proper teaching, may learn to become followers of Jesus. Thousands may thus be reached with saving truth and be led to receive Christ as a personal Savior. God wants to use everyone that's willing to reach the people of the world. Every one of you are witnesses to the world for God.
and you decide whether you'll be a blessing or not. Now, let's return to Jonah, chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 5 through 11. So the rest of the book. Say amen if you're there. Okay. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, It is right for me to be angry even to death. But the Lord said, you had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and much livestock? Now, Moses was someone who God continually had to keep refining. His whole life was a lesson um, of God's mercy and patience in refining character. Elijah also fell, but soon came back to the Savior who provided for him his whole life. And Job had his moments of sorrow, but he stood strong and refused to curse the God in whom he trusted. Even though he may not have understood why his life was terrible at the time, he still chose to love God. Now we know that Moses and Elijah were rewarded with heaven, and Job received back everything he lost and much more. But we don't really know what happens to Jonah after this. Maybe he later repented, but the end of the book didn't leave that much hope for him. Jonah didn't humble himself and realize that he had no right to be angry. When the others at, were asked, is it right for you to be angry? They realized that the answer was no, because God is good and he doesn't allow anything to happen to us that we can't handle and isn't for our greater good. Romans 8.28 says, And we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Jeremiah 29.11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. If the Lord desires us to bear a, a message to Nineveh, it will not be as pleasing to him for us to go to Joppa or to Capernaum. He has his reasons for sending us to the very place there may be someone in need of the help we can give. Everything that happens to those who truly love God is either for the refinement of their character or for the salvations of, salvation of others. Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So, what should you do? You should rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, <laughs> Okay. Let me ask you, friends, when troubles are com coming into your life, do you ask yourself, is it right for me to be angry, annoyed, sad, discouraged, jealous, or scornful? <laughs> if it's your desire to rejoice in the Lord always, even through trials and the gloomiest of days, and not have self-pity and try to justify your bad behaviors, if you wish to humble yourself and give your life to God daily, Please stand with me for the closing prayer. Dear Jesus, um, 
thank you so much for being a wonderful and merciful God and being with us through all of our trials and our process of character refinement. Please help us to always focus on you and not our problems because through you we know um, there are solutions. Um, please be with us through the rest of this day. In your name I pray, amen.